looking at the book of Mark, and we're looking at the last part of Mark, at the end of Jesus' life. And we come to this dark scene where Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a very famous scene. And you know the term kiss of death that we have in our English vocabulary comes from this incident in the Bible. And that term, kiss of death, if you look it up in a dictionary, it means to become intimate with something that subsequently causes your own destruction. Now, interestingly and ironically, it's not actually Jesus whose mission is destroyed by what happens here, is it? It's not. His, his mission isn't destroyed. His plans aren't destroyed. It's Judas's. And, and it's not because Judas is intimate with Jesus, because understand, intimacy with Jesus is always, always the kiss of life. It's never the kiss of death. But it's the fact that Judas is intimate with the swords and clubs, or the sword. Jesus makes a big deal about this. You know, he's, what, are you, what are you doing here with swords and clubs? He says, in Matthew's version of the story, he goes as far to say, anyone who takes up the sword will die by the sword. That famous line. So, so Jesus is having a problem with swords, apparently. Now, a lot of people take this passage and they take that other line in Matthew's gospel and they say, well, this is about pacifism or not. Uh, but really, you know, this is talking about something that's even much broader than that, much bigger than that, as, as important as that issue is. Because actually, if you think about that famous statement that Jesus makes, you know, when he says, anyone who takes up the sword will die by the sword, well, that's not actually true, is it? Because it, uh, there are all kinds of people uh, who have picked up a sword or a weapon and have lived to tell. They didn't die by it. And so Jesus isn't talking literally here. He's talking metaphorically. And the word sword in the Bible has a meaning that's much broader than that. What we have in this passage today is we have a, a clashing between two kingdoms in this passage, two different administrations of reality, two different uh, priorities and, and values. Uh, you have the, the right side up kingdom of this world and the upside down kingdom of Jesus and of God. And dancing here within this story about these two kingdoms, you have these different characters that Mark highlights. Obviously he highlights Jesus, but, but he zeroes in on also three disciples. You have Judas, the betrayer. Uh, you, you have the disciple who takes out the sword and cuts off the guy's ear. And then you have the mysterious naked streaker in the garden. <laughs> Clearly that disciple was from Southeast Portland. <laughs> but here, here's what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about today. I, I think there's insights. The insights in the text on each of these three disciples tells us something about these two kingdoms that are clashing together. Okay, Judas shows us what the kingdom of this world looks like, the right side up kingdom of this world. And I wanna talk about that. Peter, who we'll see is in here in the story, he shows us the difficulty of living for the upside down kingdom of Jesus. And then last, uh, I think the young man at the end, the text about him gives us deep in there, there's some insight into how we can get the power to live in Jesus' kingdom. And I want to show you later on what I mean by that. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to work back through the text and we'll talk about each of those three things. We'll start kind of big picture and then by the end we'll move closer to home, to our lives. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah. yeah. All right. Look at verse uh, 43. It says, Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Uh, and then it says... In verse 44, now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. So first I want to talk about uh, the, the right side up kingdom of this world. Now, now if you're wondering why I'm using that wording, the, you know, the right side up kingdom, I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But first, what do I mean by the kingdom of this world? In verse 43, it says, Judas shows up with this crowd that has swords and clubs to arrest Jesus. And scholars point out that for Judas to show up like that means that he was expecting armed resistance from Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus essentially starts to say, what in the world do you think you're doing showing up with clubs and swords? I mean, that shows that you don't understand me at all. Now, the sword in the Bible represents more than just the ability to kill. For example, in Romans 13, Romans 13 talks about how governments have the power of the sword. And, and, and that doesn't just mean that they have the power to execute people, but what it's talking about is it means they have the power to compel behavior. Okay, the sword represents the power to compel behavior. 
Now, there's lots of ways to do that in life. Money is a way, uh, using money is a way that you can make people do what they don't want to do, but what you want them to do. So, uh, you know, financial power, there's military power, there's political power. These are, these are all ways of making people do what they don't want to do, but what you want them to do. And it's this the power to compel behavior. That's what the sword stands for. And traditionally, kingdoms are always associated with a sword, okay? Now, what's a kingdom? Jesus has been talking about this a ton all throughout the book of Mark and, uh, and all throughout Matthew and Luke and John as well. Jesus is constantly talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and he's also talking about the kingdom of this world. Okay, so what is a kingdom? A kingdom is an administration. It's a way of ordering things. It's a way of getting things done in life. For example, uh, when a new coach comes onto a sports team, that team gets a new administration, right? We saw this a few years ago with the Portland Trailblazers, you know, and uh, under the old administration, it was Nate McMillan as head coach, and, uh, and they had a, he had a certain way of doing things, and under that administration, you know, the team had to, you know, they were, they were it was about hard-nosed defense and slow half-court offense, and then Nate McMillan got fired, and Terry Stotts came in, new coach, and he had a new administration, right? He brings in a new staff, and now they're all about, you know, fast pace offense and shooting as many shots as possible, jacking up threes, and whether or not defense is one of their values under their new administration is yet to be determined still. <laughs> but that's what happens when you have a new administration. The way of getting things done, it changes, okay? Some of you have been through this when a new boss comes into your apartment at work and changes things up, and a new administration means things are different now. There's a new order for how we, how we go about things, a new set of assumptions and goals. And what usually distinguishes one organization from another is its set of values or its list of values that it has. And usually at the top of the list, you know, there are things that are, that, the things that really count, that really matter to that administration. And then uh, toward the middle of the list, you have things that are not quite as important. And at the bottom of the list, you have things that are looked down upon or avoided. And that's usually what makes the difference in how things are done. Usually it's this list of values. And, and every single administration has a list of these values, whether it's written down or not. And so when a new administration comes in, you begin to rearrange those. You, you, they, they reorder certain values and goals. Now, understand this. In the kingdom of this world, the sword is at the top of the list. Military might, political power, uh, finances, money, these are things that compel behavior. That, that's what's at the top of the kingdom of this world's list. And, you know, there's lots of other things, but the, the things that matter, the things that really are most important are those things. And Judas shows us that, you know, by showing up with swords and clubs uh, and, and the show that he sort of puts on, I mean, why the kiss? Have you ever wondered that? Well, why, why don't he just walk up, walk in and say, there's the man, arrest him? You know, why, why, the, why the show that he puts on? Why the, why the, 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 the subtle kiss? Why, why the subterfuge and the show of it all? Judas expected that Jesus would take up the sword because Jesus uh, talked about the kingdom of God. And anybody who, back then who ever brought a kingdom used money, power, military might, or some combination of those things in order to get your way of doing things into power. And so that's what Judas was expecting. The kingdom of this world always, always says that the top of the list is the sword. It's money, it's power, it's, it's uh, politics. And, and sometimes this is very subtle, but, it, but it's there, okay? For example, I remember a uh, set of articles um, that was being circulated by, uh, it was put out by the New York Times a few years ago, it was kind of near election time, and uh, they were getting you know, national circulation, and it was a, a series of articles that they did featuring Pentecostal churches um, in America right now, and they were zeroing in on the fact that you know, some of the, uh, many of the largest churches in our country are Pentecostal churches, some of the fastest growing ones, and, but even more so, they were highlighting the fact that over this past decade, I mean, I don't know if you're, you realize that right now, uh, Pentecostal Christianity is the fastest growing religion in the world, especially uh, in third world countries right now. So they're zeroing in on this and they were going around and they're interviewing all these pastors of these Pentecostal churches. And the articles were very well written, they're very um, accurate, and they let these pastors share amazing stories. And so these guys are sharing stories about amazing things they're seeing in their congregation, all kinds of people, uh, you know, just coming to finding life, finding peace, finding joy and purpose in life, getting freedom from addiction, getting uh, involved in communities, all these great things. And they recount this. It was so interesting. At the end of each of those articles, there's a point where the reporter stops and says, this is so wonderful, but let me just ask you a question. Do you think in the end your people will be more likely to vote Democrat or Republican? <laughs> you know, peace, joy, purpose in life, freedom from addiction, community, that's wonderful. 
But anyone who's actually reading the newspaper, what they really want to know is how's this movement going to affect the vote? And, and, and you know, that, it's subtle, but it's there. And that's what I mean by saying the right side up kingdom of this world. I mean, this to us, this is just how the way things are in the world. That's the reality we know. It's, 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 it's how we get things done in the world today. Money, military power, politics. But the way that Jesus reacts to Judas shows us he completely rejects this way of doing things. Okay, because what he says in verse 48, it's pretty remarkable. Look down at verse 48. He says, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Now that word rebellion, it's an interesting word. It's a word that means a guerrilla who is using violent means, the sword, to overthrow the existing order of things to bring in a new order. And Jesus is essentially saying, do you think of me as a revolutionary? You think of me as a terrorist? An insurgent? Do you, do you think of me as a revolutionary? Jesus is saying, if you come at me with swords and clubs, that means you don't understand me at all. And so what is Jesus saying? What's the point he's making by that? You know, with these words to Jesus, what does he mean by it? Is Jesus saying, you don't understand me because I'm not trying to change the order of things. I just want to bring you peace, love, and groovy vibes in your heart. I'm Portland Jesus. You didn't come at Portland Jesus with swords and clubs. You come at him with love songs and vegan tacos. You know? Is that what Jesus said? Is he saying, you know, I just want you to find peace and love and happiness in your innermost being. But I'm not out to actually change the way that things are. Well, well that couldn't be what Jesus is saying, because that's not what he says in the rest of Mark's gospel. So, so when Jesus says, am I a revolutionary that you come at me with swords, what he's saying is, you don't understand me if you think that swords and clubs will stop me. And here's what I think Jesus is saying. He's essentially saying, I am leading a revolution, but it's a much deeper, it's a much greater revolution than you've ever seen in history because all the other revolutions basically keep the same old things on top. They're, they're, they're not real revolutions. What you always have on the top in revolutions is money and power and politics. That's what you essentially have. You just change out the people. And so every revolution brings a new set of people into power. And then the next revolution after that brings the next set of people into power. But Jesus' message is, I want to bring a whole new kind of power into power. Jesus doesn't just want a new set of people in power. He wants a real revolution, a real new kingdom, a real totally different administration of power. All the other revolutions in history, they have the same exact things at the top, money, power, and politics. And so all the other revolutions before Jesus, compared to his revolution, have just been more like fine-tuning of the same old order. It's kind of like rearranging the furniture on the deck of the Titanic. You know, I don't move these things around, but this is all kind of headed in the same direction still. Jesus is saying, I am a revolutionary. Oh yeah, but not a revolutionary that you need to take with swords because that's not how power in my kingdom even works. But if you need to take me, here I am. Just understand, I'm also not the kind of revolutionary that you can stop with swords and clubs because I'm not about the sword at all. Judas, you don't get it. You don't understand me. That's the kingdom of this world. And we see it confronting Jesus here in the garden. Now Jesus, of course, who when he was walking with the disciples, you know, on earth, his time with him, he said, my kingdom is, is not of this world. He makes a clear distinction. He, he, he's, he's about God's kingdom, not the kingdom of this world. And that's the second thing I want you to look at in this passage today. It's, it's what the next disciples' reaction shows us about the difficulty of living for the upside-down kingdom of God. Now, what do I mean by the kingdom of God? Because that's important. We talk about that a lot around here. Um, Jesus comes in the book of Mark preaching the kingdom of God, which understand, the kingdom of God is the creator God's rulership. It's his administration of reality. It's his way of ordering things. It's his, uh, his list of values for humanity and life and the world is the God who made all of it, which, uh, which all of his values and his way of ordering things is shockingly backwards and upside down when it comes to the kingdom of this world's list of values, which in turn makes uh, God's kingdom a very difficult kingdom for us to live for. What, what do I mean by that? Well, Nowhere is the kingdom of God's values better illustrated, in my opinion, than in the Sermon on the Mount, which is you know, one of Jesus' most famous sermons. We've studied it here at the church before, and uh, you can read the long version in the book of Matthew. It's multiple chapters. It's very beautiful. Um, but of all the places where Jesus contrasts the kingdom of God with the kingdom of this world, I think the most succinct place is actually in Luke chapter 6, where Luke gives us a more condensed version of the Sermon on the Mount, and there's six verses in there where Jesus actually makes a list. Remember earlier, I said, 
all administrations basically come down to a list of priorities and values. That's what changes the order of things. Well, Jesus gives us two lists in Luke chapter six. This is what he says. This is one list. He says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject you as evil because of the Son of Man. It's a list he gives for the kingdom of God. And then he gives another list. He says this next. He says, but woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. What an interesting, contrasting list Jesus gives us. And a scholar, Michael Wilcock, he, he wrote this about those, those two lists in Luke. He says this. He says, in the life of God's people then, there will be a remarkable reversal of values. Christians will prize what the world calls pitiable and suspect what the world calls desirable. And, and you know, that's exactly right. The things that the world puts at the bottom of the list are actually at the top of the kingdom of God's list. And, and the things that are suspect in the, in the kingdom of, of God are prized by the kingdom of this world. I mean, just go back to the Luke passage. What kinds of things are valued in God's kingdom? What, what's at the top of the list of the kingdom of this world in their passage? It, it's, it's power and money. He says, you who are rich. Woe to you who are rich. Another thing at the top of their list in, in, in the world is success and recognition. He says, when everyone speaks well of you, celebrityism, Recognition, that's what's at the top of the world's list of values, which Jesus warns against. But what kinds of things are at the top of the list of the kingdom of God's values in the Luke passage? Poverty and weakness. You who are poor and hungry. Uh, rejection. Marginalization. When, when people hate you and they exclude. Exclusion. It, it, that's at the top of the list in the kingdom of God. Now, as soon as you hear these two lists, as soon as anyone reads you know, these kinds of words from Jesus, now you know why some people call the kingdom of this world the right side up kingdom, and the kingdom of God the upside down kingdom, because the world's way just seems right side up, it seems natural. Jesus' approach seems completely impossible and odd and unnatural to us. I mean, the world's approach, it seems much more natural, it seems much more natural, natural biologically, for starters, I mean, whoever heard of the survival of the weakest? The survival of the sacrificers, the survival of the poor. That's not how things are. That's not how we got here. And that can't be how reality actually is. It's totally unnatural. It's unnatural biologically. It's also unnatural psychologically. I mean, when you actually hear Jesus say that what we prize and value is weakness, poverty, suffering, and rejection, well, you say, well, that's just masochism. That's a, that's a completely psychologically unhealthy way to live your life. And it's very impossible to live like that. And guess what? It is kind of impossible to live like that. And you want to see what the perfect example of how unnatural it is and how difficult it is to live in Jesus' kingdom and his administration of reality, then just look at verse 47. What are we told? It says, Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, in the book of John, we're told that specifically the disciple who pulls out his sword and cuts off the ear is Peter. Figures. Poor Peter. He just can't seem to get a break in Mark's gospel. You know, and we talked about Peter in depth in his life. We talked about failure and grace you know, a couple weeks ago. But what I want to point out is that here you have Peter, who's one of Jesus' closest disciples. I mean, he's, just not, he's not just one of the 12. He's one of the inner three, Peter, James, and John, always with Jesus. And Peter's been around Jesus. He, he's, he knows about the kingdom of God. He's heard Jesus' teachings on the kingdom of God. But when push comes to shove, what's his instincts? Pull out that sword. Why? Because the kingdom of this world says, if you want influence, then put yourself ahead of others. You take the power and you make them do what you want them to do. That's the way to get influence. That's the way to change things. Put yourself ahead of them at all costs. But Jesus says in verse 49, he says, every day, I was with you, teaching in the temple courts. He says, Peter, Judas, you, know, you, you guys have heard my teachings. You know I'm not about that stuff. And then he says at the bottom of verse 49, look, he says, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. What scriptures? 
Well, the ones he's been quoting in chapters 8 and 9 and 10 and, and here in this chapter earlier in 14 where he quotes the Jewish scriptures to refer to himself as the suffering servant whom the prophets talked about, who comes to lay down his life for the sins of many, a reproached man who will be betrayed and stepped on and taken away to his death, a man who's about suffering and self-sacrifice. Jesus is saying, don't you guys get it yet? Don't, don't you understand? He says it to Judas, he says it to Peter, and he says it to all of us. My kingdom is completely different. I'm gonna change things, and here's how I'm gonna change things. I'm gonna put others ahead of myself. You see, the way that the world changes things is you put yourself ahead of others. You get the money, you get the success, you get the power and you get the influence. But Jesus is saying, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put myself below others. I'm, I'm gonna let them be ahead of me. I, I'm gonna love my enemies. I, I'm gonna sacrifice, I'm gonna serve. I'm not gonna overcome evil with evil. I'm gonna overcome evil with good. I'm gonna give up the power. I'm gonna give up my wealth. I'm gonna give up my life. I'm gonna give it all up. And that's how I'm gonna change the world. And Jesus does it. He goes on to a cross, dies for the sin of the world. One of the most history-changing acts in the history of the world. Jesus' revolution is, is the first real revolution. Be, be, because for the first time, you know, he, he inverts, he actually inverts the order of things. It's not just a new person in power with the same old tactics, but he actually introduced a whole new way, a whole new lens of seeing the world through and a whole new way of bringing about change. And it's about self-sacrifice and putting others ahead of yourself. It's totally revolutionized the world. But it's still incredibly difficult to live for his kingdom because it's so upside down from everything that we've been inundated with and everything that history has shown us about influence and power and change in the world. And so all the time, I mean, even early on within Christendom, you see this drifting from the teachings of Jesus back to the kingdom of this world and how things are done, even in early on in Christendom. I, I think you know, the classic example is the Crusades, which by the way, uh, you know, I always, in talking to young people, it's something that skeptics are always you know, bringing, you know, you know, well, what about the Crusades? You know, that wasn't very Christian. And, and the reality is, the truth is, the Crusades were, were, were in fact the most unchristian, one of the most unchristian things that has ever happened in history. It was, it was something done under the name of Christianity, but it was totally a reversion back to the tactics of the kingdom of this world. Because it was, you know, in early Anglo-Saxon Europeans who had recently converted to Christianity, when they were threatened and when it really came down to a territory war, they reverted back to their honor-shame teachings, not the teachings of Jesus, where if, you know, well, if we lose the city of Jerusalem, then that's an affront to God, and that's a dishonorable to us, and we would never allow that to happen, and so they'll crush you. And, and, and we see this, you know, all throughout history, oftentimes you look at politics, you know, and, and things even done under the name Christian, when you look closely behind it is actually the sword. It's money, it's politics, it's power, all over again. And you know, here's, here's the thing, we have to be honest, we do this too. We get sucked right back in, we try to merge the kingdom of God with the way that the kingdom of this world operates. In other words, we're all kind of like Peter in verse 47, you know, where we say we're on Jesus' side, oh, you know, we're with the kingdom of God, but then when it comes down to it, it just doesn't feel right to us because that's just not the way things really work. So we say, for example, that we're on the side of justice and peace and fairness and putting others before yourself, but then when someone at work in the workplace challenges my will and the way I think things should be done, I reach for my sword handle. And I, and I wanna show them why they're wrong and I want everyone else to see why my way of doing things is the right and the better way to do things compared to theirs. We merge the kingdom of this world, sword on the top, then power, money, recognition, and we take that sword and we just kind of poke it into our own way of going about trying to follow Jesus. Or here's another example, you know. We know, for example, that the way of Jesus is radical generosity. I mean, just to give excessive amounts of money and possessions away to people who are suffering and who are in need. But practically, we want people to take us seriously in American culture. And so, you know, we, we still need to have a sizable house. I need to drive a nice car so people take me seriously. And my children need to wear nice clothes. And, and so, you know, if we could kind of figure out a way to just give a tiny manageable amount away each month, that doesn't really affect the quality of life of me or my family, you know, then I'll just do that so I can check the generosity box off my list and then go right along living my comfortable life and retaining the cultural status that I've worked so hard for. And in doing so, you know, I have just tried to merge the kingdom of God 
with the kingdom of this world without even realizing it. But that's what Western European Christians do. And the next thing you know, we're supposed to be on Jesus' side, but we're exactly like Peter and Judas and the others. But, but, but it's so hard. I mean, truly living for God's kingdom, it's extremely difficult because it's so upside down. I mean, truly life can't work that way. You know, we need the status. We need the house. We need the nice car. We need the new clothes. We, we need to network with influential people. I actually believe, you know, that if I could become as successful as someone like LeBron James, that that would be better for me. I actually believe that if I could have the same quality of life as Justin Bieber, my life would be better, much better. <laughs> you know, and so even in our communities, in our answer, you know, we're trying to, you know, have co coffee with someone who's well-known and respected and, you know, be friendly with people who are pretty because that's what our culture acknowledges is power and success, you know, so we value those kind of things. But you know what Jesus values? You know, you know who Jesus considers blessed? The poor, the marginalized, the rejects of society, those who are suffering. Those are the kind of people at the top of the kingdom of God's values. And so living for God's kingdom means that we prize those types of people. And so when we see the poor, when we see the weak, when we see the suffering and reject people in our culture, in our world, we value them, we prize them. They become precious to us. And so we don't just throw you know, a few bucks into the charity pot, but we go to them. We lay ourselves out for them. We, we, we do whatever we possibly can to help them. We, we don't disdain them like the kingdom of this world does or just kind of be indifferent and cast them aside but we lay ourselves out for them. And that's the way that we're invited to live. But, but if we're honest, truly living that way, it's so difficult because it goes against everything the world tells us about how to be successful in life. It's very difficult, which leads me to the last question. Where do we get the power to live like that? To truly live for God's kingdom? And I, I believe you have to look at the very, very end of the text because there's a huge clue underneath the text of the last three verses. Look back at verse 50. It says, then everyone deserted Jesus and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Okay? So, so first, you have to notice, verse 50 says, everyone at this point has deserted Jesus in the garden. Just, to, just imagine, you know, in Jesus' shoes, all of your closest friends, your 12 disciples, you've done everything with. They're, they're on your team, they're on your side, right by your side all these three years. And the moment real trouble is introduced, see ya, they're gone. But Mark zeroes in on a young man, we're told, who was a follower of Jesus, uh, but he was so intent on saving his own skin that when, uh, you, you know, he was so cowardly that when they grabbed hold of him, he was willing to run away naked through the street to get away. Now, nakedness in the Bible is a sign of shame and disgrace all throughout the, the scriptures, and it's perfectly appropriate because this man is, is a coward. He's an absolute coward, and, 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 and so, therefore, the shame of running home naked, it's perfectly appropriate. Now, my question is, what's that story in there for? You know what? Why does Mark include the naked guy? He's the only gospel writer who does it. This is the only place where it shows up. I, I, I mean, he could have at least spared us the awkward imagery, you know? With the, what, why, why, did, why does it have to be in there? There's a very old tradition in scholarship that this young guy is actually Mark himself. It's a view that goes way back in scholarship. The, the, the take is that this young guy fleeing is actually the author Mark himself, who was a young man, he would have been a young man at the time, and that this is his way of saying, I was there too, and I was just as bad as everyone else. You see, everyone has failed Jesus at this point in the story. Judas and Peter, the outsiders and the insiders have failed Jesus. The violent people and the nonviolent people have failed Jesus. The religious and the irreligious. There's, there's no one righteous, no, not one. And scholars have picked up on a neat little illusion that Mark might intentionally be using here in these verses. N.T. Wright, for example, says this about the passage. It says, the imagery of the young man fleeing naked in the garden is striking. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Going back as far as Genesis 3, like Adam and Eve, the disciples are metaphorically, and in this case, literally hiding their naked shame in the garden. Scholarship thinks Mark is actually trying to remind us about another garden. 
You see, in the beginning of the, the Bible, in the story of the world, in the Garden of Eden, there were people who were given a test in the garden and they failed and they were exposed as being naked and they fled in shame. This is one of the most famous stories in the Bible and uh, it would have been one of the most famous stories in first century Jewish thinking. It's the fall of humanity, Adam and Eve in the garden. And now here we are centuries later in the gospel of Mark and there's another garden and there's another test and everyone's failing. Everybody's failing and they're stripped naked, you know, they're, they're leaving in shame. But this time something is different. This time, in the middle of this garden, for the first time, there's a human being who is passing the test. And it's an incredible test. I mean, if you think about it, why were all these guys fleeing? What were they running away from? Why were they failing? It's because they were afraid of the world's sword. They were afraid of the swords and clubs. They were afraid of being arrested, of being put to death. That they'd be killed. But Jesus is standing firm and he's facing the world's sword head on, but he's also facing something even much worse than the world's sword. Because when Adam and Eve, you know, fled naked in the garden, they were covered up by fig leaves. And when they left the garden back in Genesis 3, they turned around and back at the entrance of the garden, they saw something that was keeping them from going back into the garden. You guys remember what this is? We talked about it a month or so ago. You remember what it was? It was a sword. It was a flaming sword flashing back and forth, an archangel, a cherubim was holding it. And Genesis 3 says it was, it was going back and forth to guard the way back into the garden. Genesis 3 says, no one could go back into the presence of God in the garden without going under this sword that was put there by God. Now, what is that sword? Well, we talked about, you know, about a month ago, it's the sword of divine justice. The Bible teaches us that our sin separates us from God, that there's no way back into the presence of God unless someone takes the sword of divine justice. And the Bible says that, that this is true, not, not just for Adam and Eve, but it's true for all of humanity who are born after them. The idea is that we were in the garden, we ran, and we fled, and we failed the test. Jesus was in the garden facing the ultimate sword of divine justice, and he stood firm for me, for you. And by going forward to the cross to die for the sins of the world, he took the sword of divine justice for us. And now here's the secret. Listen, here's the power, okay? The, uh, of the kingdom of God. When you just simply look at the way that Jesus lived, how he reversed the order of the kingdom of this world and how he lived, well, you think, I can't do that. I can't live like Jesus. You know, when you see Jesus reversing the order of things and how he lived, caring for the poor, you know, forgiving his enemies without bitterness, sacrificing his life for others, living a perfectly loving and perfectly sinless life, you look at that and you say, well, I can't do that. And you're right, you can't. Because Jesus, merely as an example, will crush you. But Jesus, as a substitute who dies as a lamb in your place for your sins, will save you and has the power to completely change you from the inside out. If you see Jesus just as an example of how to reverse the order in life, you'll never live up to that. But if you see Jesus reversing places with you, with you and me in the garden, it has a tremendous power to change you. You see, you have to understand, all the disciples in the story, they're running away, they're fleeing, but they're actually going free. They go free, they want to run free, even though they disobeyed. Jesus stands firm, he passed the test, and he's captured and killed, even though he obeyed and was faithful. He's shifting places with us. He's getting what we deserve, so that we get to share in what he deserves. And when you see that the great reversal in life is you and him, it's not just him and the poor and the sick and the needy, but when you see that he gave up all of his cosmic wealth so that you and I could become spiritually rich, if you see that he gave up his name that was above every name and came into our anonymity so that we could have the name of God put on us, if you see that, it changes you. And now you look at the kingdom of this world completely different. You, know, you look at things like money and power and reputation differently. Why? Because those things aren't at the top of the list in the kingdom we live for anymore. Money, power, reputation, success. And that means none of those things can control us anymore. None of those things have power over us anymore. A person who understands what Jesus has done for him or her, it frees you. It changes the way that you live. Because those things don't control you anymore. For example, say there's two people, 
One is living for the values of the kingdom of this world, and the other is living, learning how to be rooted and live in the values of the kingdom of God. Both of these people have a very great job, excellent pay, very good status associated with their position, and both of them suddenly find out that they're about to lose their jobs. And they know that they're, they'll likely never be able to get a job like that again. They're now gonna be you know, three or four notches down in the socioeconomic status and life. Now, now, when you're living for the kingdom of this world, here's how you know it. When something like that happens, it feels like it's the end of your life. It feels like your life is over. Why? Because those kinds of things, money, socioeconomic status, I mean, those, those are at the top of your list. You're essentially a slave to those things because those very things, your whole identity is based on status and recognition and on money and on power. It's your identity. And, and so without those things, your whole identity is gutted. So if you play by the rules of the kingdom of this world, well, then you'll most likely be willing to do anything to keep your job, anything to not lose it, even if it means you know, lying, cheating, stabbing someone else in the back. You'll do anything to keep your job. But on the other hand, if you're starting to learn how to live for the kingdom of God, here's what you know. You know that losing your job, it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be pleasant, but one of the things you've learned about the kingdom of God is that when things like weakness and suffering and poverty and rejection come near, the kingdom of God comes near. My strength is made sufficient in your weakness. And it's in those very times that you come to grips with your real treasure and your real identity. And those things can actually have a deepening work in your life for good. And you know that. And so you've learned to actually prize those things. If you live for the king of this world, when those types of things come into your life, well, then my life is over. But as a follower of Jesus, you're free. A follower of Jesus is free to take or leave things like money, power, recognition, and status, because those things don't control you anymore. That's not what you're, where your identity is. Those things don't have value to you anymore because you understand that your identity is as a child of God, it was a sinner who's, who's saved and made righteous by the blood of Jesus, and, and you have value in who, who you are now as a son or daughter of the Most High God, and you have value in the, the future that he promises you, and that's what you're looking forward to, and, and so you're free to take or leave things like money, power, and recognition. If those things come into your life, well, great. You have plenty of good you can do with them, but if they don't come into your life, or if you have them and they start to go, you also know that that's one of the ways that God's grace is gonna be able to work its way in your life. In other words, the sword is gone from your life. The compulsion, it's gone. You're free from it. And so you work in life, but your work doesn't define you anymore. You work hard, you give it your all, but it doesn't drive you into the ground anymore. And you start to get this amazing contentment and joy and peace in life that, that almost seems unreasonable and reckless to people in the world. People will say to you, you know, how can you give away your money like that? I mean, how could you just let moving to another city for that amazing career opportunity just pass you by because of the things you feel called to here? I, I don't understand. How could you get involved with that needy person when they're probably gonna take advantage of you? And the follower of Jesus says, I don't care. I'm free. It's not the end of the world if someone takes advantage of me. It's, it's not the end of the world if I lose my money, if I give it all away. And it's not the end of the world if my career doesn't pan out exactly like I had hoped. because I'm following the way of Jesus and real influence and real power and real treasure comes when I put the influence and the power and the treasure of other people ahead of my own. When I put them first and me second. And when I understand that Jesus lowered his reputation as a human and was despised so that I could be free, it changes the way that I think about reputation. If I get a thousand followers on Twitter, great. I can use it for good. If I don't, or if you lose all your followers because the world decides to go back to MySpace. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter because your sense of worth it's, and your identity, it's not tied to something like how many followers you have on social media. And you know, when you understand that Jesus has become impoverished so that I could become rich, it changes the way that I look at my wallet and my bank account. I can become risky. I, I, can, I can become a giver and a spender, recklessly, happily giving my money away. And the world says, you're crazy to put your career on the line like that. Your reputation, your money, your nest egg. 
You're crazy. And you say, I'm having fun. Because I'm living for a totally different kingdom. And I know where my real treasure is. And I don't have the sword of the world hanging over my head anymore. You know, Karl Marx, the uh, well-known German philosopher, he once said that the opiate of the people is living for another world. He famously, you know, wrote about how the belief in an afterlife, it's like an opium that just sedates people. And, and uh, you know, that if you don't believe that this world is all that there is in life, then you can't actually make it a better place. And he's absolutely wrong absolutely wrong. I'll tell you this, if this world is the only world that I have, if this money is the only money that I have, if this wealth is the only wealth that I'm going to get, if, if this reputation is the only reputation that I'm going to have, and to stand for something greater in life means that I'm going to have to lose my reputation, lose my money, lose my life, well, I'm not going to do it because that's all I got. And I worked hard for it and I, and I have to cling to those things for dear life. But what if I have a reputation that goes beyond this life? And what if I have a wealth that goes beyond this life? What if I have a life that goes beyond this life? And I'm asked to risk or even lose it for the sake of eternal life and or in the name of justice to help people in the world who are suffering. I can do it. This is a dark passage today. It ends on a really dark note, a rest scene. And so, you know, to be true to the text, I'm, I'm gonna end our sermon on a dark note. In Daniel 5, there's another famous passage about King uh, Belshazzar of Babylon, and this king is having this wild party. It's an orgy, really, and they're having a great time, and he, he doesn't know that at that very moment, there's an army marching towards a city that's going to sack his city and kill him that very night before his party is over. He doesn't know, and all of a sudden, in the midst of the party, this mysterious hand shows up and starts writing on the wall, and the message is this, your days are numbered. And listen to me this morning. If you're living for yourself, spending all your money on yourself, striving for power, focusing on your success and your reputation, you might be having a wonderful party in many ways in life. Some things might be going extremely well for you. But according to the Bible, that kingdom is going to be inverted. The days of that kingdom are numbered. And you know, for every single one of us, followers of Jesus, in this room, myself, anything in our lives that we're building right now, we're chasing after, we're cherishing, we're holding on to, that's based on recognition or money, the number of, number of people in my following, one day it will all be inverted. And it's what I did for the true benefit of others. How I cared for the poor and the needy and the hurting, the, those are the things that are gonna be recognized and celebrated one day. Because that's what the kingdom of God values. And the kingdom of God is the, the only of these kingdoms that's eternal. Why don't you go ahead and set things aside and uh, as you do, I'll, I'll just share a quick story from my life because, you know, it's one thing, you know, I've been studying this passage and, and God's been working on me and my own life, you know, because you, you come to a passage like this and you have some, some serious things to wrestle through. And uh, it's one thing to get up as a pastor and say, you know, the, king, the, the values of the kingdom of God are this and that's what we need to live for and the kingdom of the world is this, stay away from that. It's another thing for me to live that in my own life. And, uh, and just to, to demonstrate how, just like Peter, I struggle with the difficulty of living for God's kingdom, and I have this tendency to do, want to revert back to the ways of the kingdom of this world. Simple story. Last week, in my life, something happened. I get this uh, bill, this notice in the mail from my insurance company, and, uh, and it's, it's telling me that, you know, that I'm, I need to renew, pay for my premium for this next year of insurance on an address that I don't, I don't live at anymore. It was my last address. My wife and I moved into a house, uh, you know, nine or 10 months ago. And, uh, and so I, I make a phone call about this and I get one of my insurance reps' uh, assistants on the phone, kind lady, and we're talking through this and she realized, you know, oh my word, we never took your old address off your insurance. And so this, these whole last 10 months you've been paying for, you know, you paid for insurance on two locations, one of them you don't even live there anymore. And, and, and you know, when I, when I learned that, you know, I wasn't very happy about that. And, uh, you know, so I started talking to her and, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't mean or anything, but I know myself and I, I, was, I was short 
and kind of rude. And I was strictly business. I'm like, well, you know, since you guys made the mistake, I need to be refunded and you know, all this stuff. And we're, we're talking through this. And, uh, and she's like, you know, absolutely, Mr. Nelson, you know, we'll get right on this, you know, we'll take care of this. And uh, she, I was, we're sitting there while she's, you know, doing some work on the computer, there's this pause. And then she goes, by the way, how's the church going? I haven't been there in a couple weeks. <laughs> Which for me is the Holy Spirit's way of going busted. <laughs> And so I'm replaying our conversation in my head. And I'm thinking, man, I've been kind of, you know, done. And, and, you know, we finish and it kind of, the, the conversation ends quickly because she's got to go check on something. And I'm just carrying this conviction, you know, from the Holy Spirit all afternoon. And I go and I get on email. I find her email and I send her this email where I'm like, man, I am so sorry. I've been just feeling so lame about how I was speaking with you on the phone, that I was short with you, I was rude. I just feel terrible about how that reflected Jesus and will you please forgive me? And I sent this email and she like fires back this email and she's like, oh, what? That, that was nothing. I wasn't offended. You should hear what a real mean person sounds like on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, here I am living for God's kingdom. I'm a pastor, you know, teaching people these things. But when push comes to shove and I get the notice in the mail, what's my first instinct? Go for the sword, my refund. Need my refund, money. You need to do this, power. And I start to value those things above a, a woman on the other side of the phone. And you know, aren't we all? We all get kind of like Peter. You know, we all drift back. We're so inundated, the kingdom of this world.